John is currently a special agent in charge for U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement within the Department of Homeland Security. John Torres oversees the investigative mission for ICE in the District of Columbia and the state of Virginia. John previously served in numerous senior leadership roles for ICE. Most recently, he served as a special advisor on enforcement and private sector issues for ICE. During the administration transition, John led the ICE serving as the acting assistant secretary for both Secretaries Chertoff and Napolitano, overseeing over 20,000 employees and a budget over $5 billion. John also served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for ICE Operations, overseeing the Office of Investigation Intelligence, International Affairs, Detention and Renew Removal Operations, National Incident Response, and the Federal Protective Service. John, I'll uh, let you take, take the mic. Thanks. Certainly uh, pretty good timing when, uh, when Jim asked me to come out and speak to you. It was a couple of months ago, and I had just finished giving a lecture over at Georgetown. And he said, hey, you know, with your immigration background, because at ICE we cover both immigration and customs, um, but I spent probably about 24 years now in immigration enforcement. And he said, with your immigration background, we'd love to have you come out and talk about immigration enforcement and implications as it relates to uh, comprehensive immigration reform. And I thought at the time when I was talking to Jim, and uh, you know, there's no wine or beer involved at the time when we were having this discussion, um, but I thought to myself, well, you know, immigration enforcement and immig comprehensive immigration reform has really calmed down. All the talk was about health care reform. Um, there's talk about finance reform, and I thought this might be a good time to actually get out and answer a few questions about immigration. And uh, can, can you hear me now? Is that better? There you go. I hear it. All right, don't worry, I won't start all over again, but I will say that uh, as we were having those discussions and, uh, and then as I was driving down here from my office, our offices are located out in Fairfax, um, literally every talk radio station was talking about immigration reform, immigration enforcement, um, immigration, the new law passed out in Arizona, and I thought, oh, okay, I'm going to walk right into the hornet's nest here, but you know, I've been giving presentations for a number of years now, and uh, Actually, I'd uh, be disappointed if I didn't get blasted with questions at the end of this because uh, it is very obviously a controversial topic. And one thing I've learned in 24 years, I've worked for the INS, I've also now worked for Homeland Security for uh, seven years now, um, is that immigration enforcement is a very controversial and divisive topic. And what I mean by that is even the people who are uh, conservative leaning and who are so very supportive of immigration enforcement and would like us to enforce the law more um, really support us at the macro level. And then when you get into the micro level of them actually knowing someone that immigration enforcement touches, then suddenly I get hit with, uh, you know, yeah, we, we're really, we really like the fact that you're enforcing the law, however, this person that you just arrested is really a good person, he's just here to work, uh, he's got a family, he's making money, he's contributing to the community, and so what you end up with is uh, um, people that are very supportive of enforcement at the 30,000 foot level, but when it touches them personally, then my phone rings off the hook, what can you do for this particular person? And then there's a whole other set of people that don't want us to enforce the law at all, period. And it doesn't matter what kind of safeguards or oversight that we put into place um, or what type of enforcement that we do. The reality is I've learned that uh, no enforcement is really the end goal for, for some people. And so um, as I've give pre given presentations at universities or I've had an opportunity to testify up before Congress, um, it, it never fails. It is a very controversial topic. So I'll talk a little bit about ICE and I'll tell you a few stories about immigration enforcement and how I see the impact is coming along. And I won't take up too much of your time because I know you're gonna have a lot of questions. Um, but really, I'm, I'm free the rest of the night, so fire away as long as you want to. With regards to ICE, um, we talked a little bit about that. ICE is Immigration and Customs Enforcement. We're in the Department of Homeland Security. After 9-11, when the Homeland Security was created, our agency was merged with the special agents from the United States Customs Service, the special agents from INS, the detention and removal operations, and those are officers that basically affect the deportation of people every year. And we also had the Federal Protective Service that guards all the federal buildings uh, across the country, and especially here in, in, the, in the District of Columbia. 
Um, back in 2003, we also had Air and Marine Operations, um, which is now with Customs and Border Protection, but that's basically your uh, helicopters, planes, boats, et cetera, that, that help guard in conjunction with uh, our investigative mission and the, and the border uh, detection mission of CBP. And we also had the Air Marshals, which are now with TSA. And then we also had the Office of International Affairs, which we still have today. Um, 56 offices around the world, 56 attache offices, a number of uh, assistant attache offices. So we have a very large presence internationally. As for our investigative mission, the special agents uh, across the country, there are about 7,000 special agents. There are about 8,000 deportation officers and immigration agents. Um, immigration agents slightly different than a special agent. The special agent um, goes out and conducts uh, criminal investigations, works with the United States Attorney's Office. We'll do a lot of undercover. We do wiretaps. We do the whole gambit of uh, any type of investigation that has a nexus to the border. And that border could be land border, sea border, airport, or even a, a cyber border. We have a, a, a substantial cyber investigations uh, division as well as uh, financial investigations as money gets laundered and uh, shipped in and out of the country. Um, for our special agents, we have 26 of those offices across the country. I am the special agent in charge for Washington, D.C. and the state of Virginia. So we work with the U.S. attorneys for the Eastern District of Virginia, which is based in Alexandria, Western District of Virginia, out towards Charlottesville, and then uh, here in the District of uh, Columbia. And we work with them regularly, bring a number of cases. Our priorities, national security and public safety. What I mean by that is uh, in addition to working our own national security investigations as they relate to uh, kind of proliferation of sensitive technologies that are illegally exported, especially to countries where there are laws that prevent people from exporting that. And it could be anything from night vision goggles to sensitive technologies to certain types of military parts. We do a number of those investigations. In fact, we just settled a case here uh, out of our Washington, D.C. office with uh, BAE. That, uh, that it's one of the largest uh, techno technology for, uh, firms overseas in the UK. Um, when we charged them a couple of years ago, we've been in negotiations through the US Attorney's Office. BAE agreed to settle that case with a $400 million fine. And so um, literally the first day that that settlement went into effect, BAE paid that in, in, in its entirety on the first day that they had opportunity to pay that. There's a lot of money to be made in some of these uh, businesses. And as you can see, when they're breaking the law, they make a lot more money. And, and there are significant fines and penalties and forfeitures that they have to pay. We also uh, support the, the FBI's mission through the Joint Terrorism Task Force. We, have, uh, we are the second largest contributor to the JTTF. Um, we have a number of agents literally assigned to the JTTFs across the country, and we use our immigration and customs authorities uh, to contribute to those investigations. There are a number of times where you can't make a specific terrorism investigation, and, and quite frankly, you don't want to wait for something to blow up before you can use your terrorism statutes. And so we'll use our authorities um, during the course of that investigation to disrupt plots or to uh, use that to get more information uh, for particular cases. We have a number of those cases that are ongoing right now. I was literally meeting with uh, the FBI assistant director who oversees Washington just yesterday to go over some of the cases we have ongoing. And so we have a very good relationship uh, with the FBI. We do a lot of drug smuggling, both inbound and outbound. Um, we have a task force with DEA. Uh, we also have task forces with ATF regarding gun smuggling. A lot of you will say, well, doesn't DEA do that? Doesn't ATF do that? Well, yes, but also, again, anything that crosses the border, whether it's people, places, things, humans, you name it, um, it's going to fall right into our jurisdiction. We have 400 different criminal statutes that we enforce. Uh, every single day, and that doesn't include our civil immigration and civil customs authorities, which we also use. So the drugs, the guns, the money laundering, the uh, kind of proliferation of, uh, of arms and sensitive technologies, gangs, big problem, Northern Virginia, big priority for us. 
Um, we, there's a number of foreign national gangs, transnational gangs, MS-13, for example, where we can use our authorities. Uh, we have a number of un ongoing cases uh, in, the, in the Northern Virginia and Washington, D.C. area related to gangs. We have immigration fraud, counterfeit identity uh, cases where they sell fake green cards so that they can get identities. Immigration fraud. We re two years ago, we arrested an employee of Citizenship and Immigration Services who was selling naturalization uh, certificates and literally putting them into the system so that it would look like they were uh, actually U.S. citizens. And uh, last count, well, he went to prison. He got 15 years in prison. But last count, we we're up to a little bit over 800 people that he had sold that citizenship to that were still working with a number of different agencies, including State Department, to try to locate those people and uh, basically clean up that backlog. Um, and we're prioritizing those by some of those people, believe it or not, actually may have uh, security clearances based on the new identities that this person created. So as you can imagine, it's a big national security headache for us also when we work some of these cases. Um, human smuggling, human trafficking. I was up on the Hill today with Congressman Wolf. We were briefing about the number of human trafficking cases that we have in the area, forced labor, uh, forced sex trafficking. Um, there are a number of cases where you have these brothels in Northern Virginia and D.C. We've done a really good job uh, working with the U.S. Attorney to clean up some of them in Washington, D.C., but we didn't have that same type of task force in Northern Virginia, so we're trying to create one now, working with a number of different state and local police departments so that we can focus on some of those uh, sex trafficking cases. We did some back in my days. I've also I ran an office in Chicago, ran an office in Denver, ran the Newark, New Jersey office. And what I saw in Denver was a lot of Russian, Albanian sex trafficking and forced labor cases. Chicago, it was uh, Eastern Europeans and, and uh, cases from Mexico. New Jersey, New York, it ran the whole gamut. It was a little bit of everything. And here in D.C., we see a lot of Asian and Latin American uh, sex trafficking rings where they'll take the girls, they'll hold their passports, they'll threaten their families back at home. Uh, with the Asian cases, for example, they'll charge them anywhere from twenty dollars to $100,000 to get smuggled into the country. And then they'll keep their passports and make them work off that debt by forcing them into prostitution. And they'll lock them up. They'll keep them locked up in rooms. They won't let them out in public. And until they pay off that debt, um, as you can imagine how horrible that would be, um, those rings will move around the East Coast from New York to New Jersey to Baltimore to D.C. all the way down to Florida, and they'll keep the girls moving about uh, every two to three weeks. So we have several of those cases that we're working in, and those are a big priority for us. So that's touching a little bit, getting more on strictly immigration enforcement, worksite enforcement, hot topic, divisive topic. Do you arrest the workers who are illegal? Do you arrest the employers? Do you do both? Um, there's been a lot of debate in recent years over how and what kind of strategy to use with those types of cases. We can talk a little bit about that. Um, I, I remember back in my days working those types of cases in Los Angeles in the early 1990s. And um, quite frankly, the, the strategy back then under the INS was to go out and do an audit of a company's I-9 forms look at their books, look at their accounting records, and if the books weren't good, you might arrest that employee who was illegal and then fine the company. And there were some significant fines, a million dollars here, a couple million dollars there, or it could be a $10,000 fine on a small business. Um, but in reality, um, some of those businesses just looked at that as a corporate parking ticket, cost of doing business. And so it was really, um, for the agents that worked those cases, including myself, I thought, what's, what's the point here? What's the purpose? You're really spinning your wheels, a lot of government resources, and you're really not affecting change, or you're not creating any type of self-compliance. And so those cases went away. 9-11 happened. And suddenly the focus came, became critical infrastructure protection, meaning let's go take a look at people at nuclear power plants, at uh, electrical facilities, at refineries, or at airports, or any place where um, w w would be a likely target for a, a terrorist to attack or to make use of. And let's take a look at who has access to them and who's actually working there. 
And so for probably a couple of years after 9-11, there was a big focus on working with the security directors in all those locations to find out how many people were working there. O'Hare Airport, for example, when I was in Chicago, you had about 350 workers that were illegally in the United States working at O'Hare Airport. Quite frankly, most of them were just working, trying to send money back to their families. But the reality is they were working on fake identity. We didn't know who they were. We didn't know where they were from. And so obviously you have a big security risk because you just don't know um, whether or not the person could potentially want to do something or could be forced to do something because of their status and, and be taken advantage of or extorted. So that became a focus for a little while. Then that shifted. And, um, and probably in the last five years, worksite enforcement per se came back into the picture with a stronger focus on bringing criminal charges against both the employers and the employees, charging the workers with, uh, who were in possession of the counterfeit ID cards and using them to get jobs, charging them with identity theft or aggravated identity theft, and then going after the businesses and uh, charging them with harboring of an illegal alien or transporting or illegally employing and then literally finding them and using asset forfeiture. And there, there are several cases that we worked over the years to include uh, one case against a, a pallet company where we arrested a thousand people nationwide in uh, one action and later on that company uh, agreed to uh, settle that case with a, a felony conviction of the company and some of its officers and pay $22 million fine. Um, we had some other cases, um, one in Iowa, for example, where we arrested about 500 of the workers, um, but a number of them actually were cooperating with us, and we were able to then charge the employers who were holding them against the will, not paying them appropriately. They were working in pretty bad conditions, and uh, um, really it was a, a, almost a forced labor type of situation in some of those cases. So um, we worked that very vigorously for the last few years. And, uh, and probably in the last year and a half, the focus has shifted a little bit more to really focusing only on the employers, the most egregious employers, and use both the criminal penalties, the administrative civil fines, and then to use um, debarment, which is a, a tool that allows us to debar a company from actually ever doing any contracting business with the federal government, and not just with us, with the federal government as a whole. And so you have a number of companies that, especially in this area, but th they will have significant contracts in business with the federal government, and once um, they are found guilty of hiring illegal aliens, they could lose that ability to, to conduct business with the government, which is a really strong hammer. And what we're seeing is a lot of people willing to come to the table to negotiate, and actually that has started to change behavior. In fact, tomorrow I'm flying out to Kansas City to go speak to, to 150 meat packers uh, in the Midwest that want to be able to do the right thing and want to change their hiring habits. And so what we're seeing is people coming to the table because either they don't want to get fined, but at the same time they don't want to lose the ability to do government with the business. So. Worksite can be a little controversial, and you may have some questions about that. We can talk a little bit about that. Um, another area that's very controversial is uh, detention, ICE detention. Um, ICE has the ability to detain 33,000 people on any given day. We're funded for 33,000 detention beds. And really, it, the, these aren't criminal detention beds. People aren't being sent and sentenced to prison, and then we... We, we house them in a prison. What it is is civil detention, and the difference being is, yeah, it still looks like a jail in some instances, some areas, depending on, on the ratings, but some could be uh, more maximum security, some could be very low security. We have some detention facilities that, uh, quite frankly, look like dormitory rooms, um, and then others that literally, you know, you're in a prison. Um, but the purpose for that is to ensure that the people that we charge with being here illegally um, will show up in court and then adhere to the immigration judge's final order, meaning either they are found uh, removable and they need to leave the country or they, or they are given some sort of benefit and they're allowed to stay. And what we found over the years is that the people that who are arrested for not being here legally and detained 98.7% of those will leave the country if they're detained. 
that will comply with the judge's order eventually because they want to get out of detention. They don't want to stay locked up. And so the average length of detention um, is about 20 days for, for everyone. Some are longer, some are shorter. Some could be in detention for a day. Some could be in detention as they fight their case for a longer period of time. What we've also found is that for people that we don't detain and that we release on some sort of uh, bond or bail or, or conditions, 47% of those will ultimately adhere to a judge's order and leave the country. And then for those that we don't place any conditions on and just release on their own recognizance, if we said, here's, here's a piece of paper with a date where you need to show up at immigration court, literally about 11% of those ultimately comply with the orders. And so those people that, that don't comply, that 89% that aren't held under any conditions, or that's 53% that are absconding even though they have some sort of conditions, they then become immigration fugitives. And what we saw over the years is that number rose from about 100,000 to about 300,000 to a, really a peak of 637,000 people about three years ago maybe four years ago now, 2006. So it's 637,000 people that have been ordered removed that never left the country. And so Congress then authorized ICE to create fugitive uh, removal teams, basically. These fugitive teams started with about 18. Now ICE has about 105 of those. Um, there are a number of teams in every, literally every city across the country. They prioritize their cases by those that could be a national security risk, to those who are public safety risks, to those who are serious criminals, all the way on down to someone who has just violated their status. Um, and they've been able to bring that, that backlog, so to speak, down to about 500,000. And, and that number continues to drop as these teams go out and arrest people who are out of status. Um, that can be controversial, too, because basically, in some instances, some of these people have been uh, uh, ordered removed six, seven, eight, ten years, and they've since started families, and now they have equities here, and they've been using a different identity, for example. And so when they end up becoming arrested, a lot of people will want to vouch for them and say, look, we shouldn't send them back. They've already been here. This is the only crime they've committed. And, and so uh, really... Our job is to go out and enforce the judge's order, take them back to, to court, and let the judge make a decision from there. Um, with regards to immigration detention, that I mentioned that we have 33,000 people. At one time, we actually had to create a family facility. And what I mean by that is we had a family uh, residential center in Austin, Texas, we had to create because what we saw in working with the Border Patrol and many Border Patrol agents is that families or smugglers were posing as families. They were bringing in, uh, uh, pretending to be a husband and wife, bringing in a baby, usually two years old or less who couldn't speak, and as they would bring them in, they would, quite frankly, would turn themselves in because they knew we didn't have the ability to detain a family. And what we didn't want to do was send the father one place, send the mother another place, and then have social services come in and take custody of the baby. So basically, you got a free pass if you were coming into the country getting smuggled in with a baby. And, and the smugglers knew it, and so they would come into the country, turn themselves into a Border Patrol agent, and say, I'm here, I have a baby, you get a parking ticket, off you go, show up at court. 89% of those people would never show up at court. And then they'd send the baby back to Mexico, for example, with another family and start all over again. And so the problem was getting pretty serious for us in the sense that we were literally, because of the policy that we had in place at the time, were uh, endangering children because as, as there was a case in Victoria, Texas back in 2004 where you had about 90 people in the back of an 18-wheeler where the smuggler who was bringing them in uh, somewhere near, it was Victoria, Texas, near Houston, um, he decided he wasn't going to put the air condition on to save gas and locked them in the back of the 18-wheeler. As you can imagine, a number of them died, a number of them had heat stroke, and there were children in the back. And it was a, a not, a, not a nice scene, um, and it really spurred a lot of action to, to go forward and do more human smuggling investigations and take a look at the policies that we had in place at the time. So we changed the policies, and we, and we created a family residential center in Austin, Texas, and said if you're going to be smuggled into the country, you're going to go right into custody. 
and we basically we were trying to create deterrence so that they wouldn't bring, bring babies and children into the country. And quite frankly, that worked. But it also brought a different set of problems for us because quite frankly, we weren't experts at the time in how to house children and families and creating uh, residential centers. And so um, we created this facility to hold up to 500 people. Quite frankly, we never filled it past about 250 because the word got out fairly quickly. And they stopped, the smugglers stopped using babies and they stopped coming in as a family unit. And families heard about it and they didn't want to come in and be detained. And so we then had to later on separate that facility, split it into two, and then we used one half of it for uh, uh, women detention and then the one half for families. And when you walked in, it just it looked like a school. I had paintings, I had classes, we had teachers there. A um, lot of uh, social activities, field trips, a lot of different things that, w that we set up there. But then we started getting sued by everybody. And literally, I spent a number of days in, uh, in negotiations and settlement negotiations with the ACLU down in Austin, Texas. And uh, a lot of the things that we were starting to implement became uh, part of the settlement conditions that we, th we wanted to implement to make sure that the families were being treated right and were being taken care of properly. And then ultimately, because we really had no use for it, we shut that facility down about a year ago. So what I learned from that particular part is that uh, um, even with the best intentions, it, it could become this huge monster headache for you in trying to manage a very small portion of what we did as an agency but it kept us very busy. Um, getting away from detention, we also have what we call the criminal alien program. What I mean by that is someone who is arrested, who is a foreign national here, under the law is considered a criminal alien uh, under the federal statute. And what I mean by that is someone is here, they get arrested by state and local for some other offense, and then they end up in jail. It could be something as simple as uh, loitering or drunk driving, or it could be as serious as murder or um, some sort of uh, racketeering or gang or you name it. And so ICE has a number of teams that go to all the different jails, and they will interview all the foreign nationals and determine their status. If they are not legally here, then we'll place a hold on them, a detainer, if you will. And then when they finish their jail sentences, they get turned over to ICE, and then ICE will remove them uh, back to their country after they have a hearing with the immigration judge. Immigration judges are not part of Homeland Security. They're part of Department of Justice. It's a whole separate division. But um, we will be, we, there, our detention removal people, our operations there, are the ones that will hold anyone that we take into custody until they have their hearings. So. Um, Literally, we started that program about four years ago. Uh, we took about 60,000 people into custody. Today, it's about 350,000 a year that we're taking out of the jails um, and prisons, both federal and state, across the country where people get into trouble. Even people that are here legally, I'm not talking about naturalized citizens, I'm talking about those that have a green card. If they're here legally and they commit certain crimes, that green card can be revoked because they're not complying with the conditions of their green card. And under law, there are a number of what we call aggravated felonies um, or crimes invo involving moral turpitude that can get a person's green card revoked. And I have a number of friends who uh, have uh, resident alien cards, green cards, and they say, well, you know, why should I ever get naturalized? And I'll give them the examples that uh, you never know. You could be out with a friend one day and you get stopped and that friend has a bunch of drugs in the trunk and next thing you know, everyone's getting arrested and it's going to be a big legal headache for the person who has that green card to not only have to worry about fighting those charges, even if they're not guilty, but you know, you'll have to work their way through that case, but then later on having to worry about the fact that uh, uh, it could affect their immigration status. And so uh, criminal aliens, big priority, national security, big priority, uh, detention is, is a, a big priority. You have a number of different specific cases. I can give you an example of one. I was given a presentation in Denver, um, Colorado, about three years ago, where you had a uh, um, a person who was driving very aggressively down one of the freeways. He cut off two women who went off the highway, crashed into a basket of robins, and killed a three-year-old who was there to get ice cream with his grandmother. Um, when they arrested the guy that caused the accident, he was claiming to be a U.S. citizen. Um, the local police department there in Aurora, Colorado, ran a records check against our databases, and when they ran the records check, they put in a place of birth as being 
Colorado, United States. And so automatically our record, our database system kicked it back and said the person is a U.S. citizen. There's nothing we can do about it from an immigration standpoint. And so later on, when he was in jail, one of our guys said, this, is, this seems awkward, went and interviewed him. And it turns out he was a, a U.S. citizen imposter. He had actually uh, uh, been in the United States. He came from Mexico and had applied for benefit under a different name with Citizenship and Immigration Services, but submitted his fingerprints. And at the time, we were offering a program called Secure Communities, where anyone who gets booked into a jail their fingerprints when they're run through the FBI to see if there's any past historical arrests. They will also go to the DHS systems to find out whether or not ICE has ever, ever arrested them or whether they've applied for a benefit. Well, back then there was what we call a sanctuary policy in place. And there are a number of cities that have some sort of sanctuary policy. San Francisco has, a, has one to a certain extent. Los Angeles has an executive order. Uh, Chicago has a city council ordinance. Um, Houston had one, and I can tell you a story about Houston also, but ultimately they were under a, a directive that they do not cooperate, the local police department the, is not allowed to cooperate with immigration authorities and share information. And so when, the, when it came out that they were really, the person was actually illegal and should have been deported and should have been reported to us when he was arrested the first time, six months before the accident, um, the police department, as I've seen happen many times, the police chief merely points the finger at us, points the finger at me, and says, oh, we, we, we tried to call them, but they told us he was a U.S. citizen. And we came back and said, well, yeah, that's true. You told us he was a U.S. citizen. And they said, but, you know, normally we would call you, but you guys never respond. And then we pull out our database, says, yeah, but however, there were these 1,000 other calls from neighboring cities around you that have all... Uh, um, submitted inquiries to our databases and we responded accordingly and here's all the results and so immediately they all backtrack and then in the end what happens is you get a change of the sanctuary policy saying that for certain reasons then they will cooperate with us and what that usually means is public safety like gangs uh, we've arrested 14,000 gang members since 2004 sexual predators 15,000 sexual predators we've arrested since 2004 national security drug dealers uh, certain key types of crimes that uh, the cities will want to cooperate with us on. In Houston, for example, we had a case where there, there's what's called an immigration violator data, database in NCIC. NCIC is a National Crime Information Center that a police department can send an inquiry on. If you get pulled over on the side of the road, they're going to run your driver's license and they're going to run some sort of check to see if you're wanted. Well, one of, the, one of the data systems is an immigration sub data system that says if you're wanted by immigration authorities, but it'll say you're wanted for a civil immigration warrant, not for a criminal arrest warrant. Um, there are some police departments, Houston was one of them at the time, that said we're not going to honor those warrants because it's civil and our people don't have training and immigration um, enforcement is a federal matter. We don't honor those. There, there are cities that do that. We're, that's how, fine. We have plenty of work to do. That's how that works. It frustrates some of, uh, of the officers on the ground, frustrates some of our agents on the ground. But ultimately what happened in this case is uh, they pulled over uh, a man outside of Houston. He had one of the immigration warrants um, by policy. They didn't honor it. They ignore it. They let him go. Six months later, another police officer pulled him over. That guy shot and killed that police officer. And you can imagine the outcry when they found out that they could have been turned all over. That person could have been turned over to us six months before and been deported. The local police union uh, was in a huge uproar. Um, I went down to go speak to the, the mayor at the time. I spoke uh, with the police chief and the sheriff. And there were a number of significant policy changes that, um, as a result of that, unfortunately, a police officer was shot and killed, um, but usually some sort of significant event that'll take place and then there'll be a, a, a backlash or a tidal wave of, uh, of reaction from the community. And in this case, the policy was modified so that in certain instances, um, the police department could work with us. And quite frankly, as we talk about that, we're not in the business of looking for every day laborer or every person on the street or every maid or every nanny. Um, 
33,000 detention beds, 20,000 employees. Um, as you can imagine, we'd be very busy and we, we prioritize by those that are the most serious criminals and national security risks. So um, that really takes me back to where almost where we started with uh, Arizona. Um, and, and some people have asked me, well, what do you think of the Arizona law and how is that going to impact you? Um, one of the things that's interesting about the Arizona law is, as it has been passed is that it gives state and local police officers the authority to question, and in fact, it actually directs them. It says that they will are required to ask a person about their immigration status if they encounter them and have reasonable suspicion that they may be a foreign national, as opposed to other laws I've seen or when we've done our delegation of authority. And, we, and when we do a delegation of authority, it's called 287G, it's, a two, it's section 287G of the Immigration and Nationality Act. Um, we confer and convey that authority to state and local police officers, but that's after they've completed three weeks of training and then they are supervised by us so that we monitor and oversight their use of our authority. In this instance, that is not the case. This is a state law that says for the first time they're getting their own authority, their own immigration authority, and that they can use that to make arrests. Now, how that could impact us as an agency? Well, yeah, they can make the arrests, but that law doesn't give them the authority to detain and deport. So that means, guess what? They're gonna be knocking on our back door saying, here's another one, or here's another 10, or here's 15 people that we think are illegal, and here, you guys take them from here. And so as you can imagine, our concern would be that, uh, to use a term, lesser priority than people that we're looking for, they may not be a gang member, they may not be a rapist, they may not be a sexual predator or a serious criminal. It could just be someone they encounter and turn them over to us, and then we're going to have to make a decision. Is that someone we want to detain, or do we in turn just release them on a very low bond or on their own recognizance? And it could really turn into a revolving door type thing where they're either being released right back in the community, or they're going to be voluntarily returned to Mexico, where then they have the ability to try to come back. And, and, and I say that Mexico because in Arizona, the majority of people that are arrested are from Mexico. But uh, literally, it could apply to all 193 countries that we dealt with last year. We deported people to 193 countries. Um, so we're talking about people from everywhere um, if they were here um, and out of status or in violation of some sort of status. So Arizona is a hot topic. Um, a lot, a lot of things. I've, you know, in 25, 30 minutes, I've tried to touch on a little bit of everything, but there is so much more we could talk about. There's a number of cases I've worked over the years, we've been involved with in 25 years, everything from terrorism, 9/11, to uh, the railroad serial killer in Texas, to some of my close friends that ran uh, the the Elian Gonzalez investigation, and so. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you to ask as many questions as you want, and please don't be shy. I'll be glad to answer them. Thanks for coming tonight. I um, just wanted to ask you, how, in your opinion, how likely is it that uh, human trafficking forms a nexus with terrorist organizations, uh, just like the development of narco-terrorism? Well, I won't say for human trafficking, for example, there, there's there's two types of laws. There's human smuggling and human trafficking. Human trafficking is, uh, you can differentiate human trafficking because human trafficking requires someone to be forced into the country and into either a, a forced labor situation or sexual trafficking, um, and it has to be forced against their will or by fraud and deceit. And so to use them for terrorist purposes, that is, is very unlikely. But for human smuggling, for example, to bring uh, terrorists into the country, um, I've been asked that question a number of times, especially up on Congress, how many terrorists have been smuggled across southwest border. Um, actually, I've seen more people come in through the northern border, through Canada, um, than across the southwest border um, because there's so many border patrol agents that patrol down there and a number of inspection points. But having said that, um, we, we see cases that, that give us some serious concern. Um, we have a, a couple of cases that are ongoing right now that 
quite frankly, there are a number of uh, smuggling routes that originate in, in the Middle East, for example. They're brought in through South America, sometimes through Cuba into Mexico, and then they try to stage in Mexico and bring them to the United States. So those, uh, those types of cases are, are right up at the top. Um, there's actually a human smuggling and trafficking center right here in Washington, D.C., um, where for the first five years of it, uh, an ICE agent was the director of that now today. Um, we've flipped that. FBI has now got the directorship, and we're the deputy director, and we work very closely with the Department of State, and they focus on those issues exactly. Hi, right, sir. Uh, thank you for coming. Sure. Uh, my question is related to the, uh, I believe it's the 287G program that you referenced before. Right. Uh, where ICE uh, trains state and local authorities. Given that that program is fairly similar to the Arizona law that's, that's proposed, with the, with the exception that ICE is directly involved in training people under the 287G program, can you give us uh, maybe some statistics on how the 287G program has worked, how effective it is? Yeah, I've actually seen it work very well in some areas. And I've seen it work not so well in other areas. Um, I'll give you some examples. Especially, there's two types of programs under 287G. One is a jail program, a jail enforcement program. The other is a task force model. Um, in Washington, D.C. and Virginia, actually, you'd be surprised, but they're, uh, in, in the area that I oversee now, um, we have the most task force models. Um, we have uh, many with Prince William County, some, some with Fairfax County agencies, and some in Loudoun County. Um, but the jail model is much more successful because what that does is it gives jail booking officers, the sheriff's deputies, for example, when someone gets arrested and booked into a jail, those sheriff's deputies would then have the ability to, as long as they're processing, to just ask the next question and say, okay, what's your status? And, and they'll focus on those that, are, that have an indicated foreign place of birth or the record check will come back as a foreign place of birth. And so it becomes a very efficient process. You already have them in custody. They determine that the person is not here legally. They can continue the processing and ultimately that person will then be taken to immigration court or removed. And it works very well. Um, they're in some, some of the jails, Orange County, LA County, Maricopa County, um, Tarrant County, and Dallas County. They have very successful programs where people are, it's like one-stop shopping as someone gets booked in. Um, I've seen it where it doesn't work so well in a task force model. And what I mean by that is uh, normally we don't get a lot of complaints from the community when we're enforcing immigration law against people that have committed crimes and they're in the jail and some, some people in the community um, are outraged that here we are, uh, a very welcoming country, we bring a lot of people in and then they come here and commit crimes, uh, some crimes pretty heinous, some against uh, members of the community that are pretty violent. And so when we enforce that law, we don't hear a lot of backlash or a lot of complaints or protests. But one day I came into my office, a newspaper article waiting for me um, from outside of a, a police department outside of Dallas, Texas. And it, the story talked about how there were these large protests outside the jail. And I thought, well, this is interesting. I've never seen this in my entire career. There's got to be something going on. And so I reached out down to that office. I said, I need all your stats. I need to see what you're doing. I need to see how many people you train. And it turned out that before we put the program in place, we were getting about 25 to 30 referrals a month from that jail of people they suspected of being illegal that they wanted us to look at that had committed crimes. After we put the program in place, we were getting about 200 to 250 referrals a month. And so when I saw that, that was a red flag. I thought, okay, well, maybe they're being more efficient, but I want to see what the people were arrested for, what was the underlying crime, and why is there such a significant jump. And when we really broke it down in that particular jail, there were some officers that were deciding to use that authority and pulling people over for making a wide right turn, riding a bicycle without a helmet, um, not using their blinker, and quite, you know, a lot of the people don't have ID, and they were immediately bringing them into jail. And, and in my opinion, they were using them uh, as pretext, pretextual stops so that they can enforce immigration law. And that was what was really causing the uproar and the protests, and we had to go backtrack there and, and actually monitor that more closely and have better oversight. So there's part of what you see um, with the uproar in Arizona is that without that proper oversight or training that 
you might have some rogue officers that are going to go out and just enforce the law against everyone with brown skin in Arizona, for example. And believe me, and throughout my career, I've had a number of people call me up, police sergeants, detectives, chiefs, sheriffs, and they've, they'll call me and say, John, we don't, want, we don't work with you guys. We don't want to have anything to do with you guys. We like our immigrants. Okay. What they really meant to say was they like their workers and they like their cheap labor and that they like the people on that end of town on the other side of the tracks. And then as the word got out that they were a very welcoming city, then suddenly the, those workers started crossing the other side of the tracks. They started opening up businesses that would say Tienda on the front of the store and little downtown Main Street. And then three, four years later, I'm getting a call from that same sheriff saying, John, when you come over here and sweep up this mess that all these illegals are making over here? And I said, Sheriff, our guys don't do brownouts. I don't believe in doing a brownout. We're not going to go out there and arrest and sweep every single brown person. I said, some of them are here legally. Some of them are not here illegally. I didn't want to rub it back in their face and say, hey, four years ago you told me to get lost. But the bottom line is we're talking about people problems here. I've been asked before um, by reporters, do you support open borders? And I said, it's not my job to support open borders or to have an opinion about open borders, quite frankly. So the reality is, if the law is passed tomorrow and says there are open borders, are the communities prepared to handle the people problems that may come with that? There's going to be a, a lot more people that will be here. And are the schools ready? Are the hospitals ready? Are the towns ready? In reality, my focus is still going to be there are people that are coming here illegally that are going to break the law, that we're going to take away their status, and we may have to send them back. And so, anyway, long-winded answer, but yes, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important issue. Thank you, sir. Um, I was wondering if you could just talk about maybe uh, if you guys collaborate with foreign governments or you know, international uh, similar agencies like you. We do. We work with a number of different agencies. Um, I've been down to Australia for the four country conference um, to work with my counterparts from Australia, from Canada, from the UK. Um, we work with uh, SOCA over in Europe. We have our 56 attache offices around the world. I've uh, taught down at uh, the Law Enforcement Academy out at Budapest to talk about human smuggling and trafficking. Um, given terrorism seminars in Moscow where we work with our counterparts over there um, where the, the Russians are dealing with the Chechens and we were dealing with Al-Qaeda and they were both had similar backings. Um, what, what we do in a lot of cases, we, we have a number of foreign laws that as they touch the U.S. we enforce. Um, we have sex trafficking. Um, in addition to sex trafficking, there's sex tourum, tourism laws. We did the first seven out of eight cases under sex tourism where U.S. citizens from here travel abroad to go have sex with minors because it is legal in that particular country, Thailand, for example, in areas where it's legal. Well, that, that is now a crime to leave here to go have sex with a minor and then come back. And so we can then work those investigations and take the people into custody and prosecute them here in the United States. And we've seen a number of those cases. So yeah, we work very heavily with our foreign counterparts. I'll echo my thanks for uh, your joining us. A couple of years ago, one of the big issues about immigration was regarding driver's licenses. Um, for you immigrants, and I was wondering what your thoughts were on that. You mentioned a case where somebody had taken the identity of a, um, of a U.S. citizen to pass themselves off. Um, is that something that you see a lot of as a problem, or do you kind of think it's too hyped up that people use you know, driver's licenses to get you know, fake papers and that sort of thing? The, the majority of cases that I've worked, been involved with, or seen relate to people that have fake driver's licenses, but they get the driver's licenses for the purposes of working. Um, for those of you that have ever filled out an I-9 form, if you don't have a U.S. passport, which is one of the standalone documents you can submit, you have a U.S. passport, you check the one box and you're done. If you don't have a U.S. passport or you don't want to submit that passport, or people that don't have U.S. passports because they're born in another country or citizen of another country, then the two documents that are required, and there's a list, there's a long list of the two categories, but the most popular are driver's license for one category and a social security card for the other. And so as a result, when that law was passed back in 1986, it created a proliferation of counterfeit document mills, as we call them, plants, uh, schemes, so people could counterfeit driver's licenses and social security cards. Um, they sell anywhere from $50 a pair to $100 a pair to thousands of dollars a pair, depending on what country you're from and how genuine they look. 
Um, I think driver's licenses legitimately for illegals pose an issue for us from a law enforcement perspective because those driver's licenses are then used as a building block to get other types of identity uh, or to get other types of documents or benefits that normally they may not be entitled to because they're not here in the country illegally. So I think it, it can be a problem. People like to talk about how some of the 9-11 hijackers came here, got driver's licenses in Virginia because at the time it was very easy to get a driver's license in Virginia. In fact, so much so that our agents in Virginia before I, I was uh, running Virginia, our agents in Virginia worked a number of cases um, with uh, corrupt DMV officials who were selling driver's licenses, even though people weren't eligible to get them. And people were coming as far away from Washington State and New York City and down in Florida because word had gotten out, it was very easy to get driver's licenses. After 9-11, they closed that up because a couple of the hijackers had driver's licenses from uh, Virginia. But as you get further away from that time frame, it, it becomes a debate again as to whether or not um, people should have driver's license. The car counter argument is they're here, they're illegal, they're driving, you might as well regulate them, make sure that they're taking the tests, learning how to drive, getting insurance. Um, if you've ever had been in an accident with someone who doesn't have insurance, very frustrating. And so there, there is a counter argument to both sides of that. Uh, I'll ask one. You know, this, is a, this is your graduate program and our folks that probably want to join the department at some point. Can you talk a little bit about recruitment and kind of programs that are in place for ICE that um, bring on the we have uh, an intern program out of Washington, D.C. Um, that you can follow up on through, through Jim, and I can get him more information about our recruiters. Um, for example, yesterday I, I hosted 11 of our interns from our headquarters out at our office on a, quote, field trip. They wanted to come out and see how field office works. We took them to the airport to see how we work with CBP, see our airport operations. Um, we took them to, our, to show them some of our undercover uh, equipment and our, our different types of techniques and, and gave them a lot of briefings. And they literally spent the day following our agents around yesterday. Um, but our, we have a, a, a significant internship program um, through our headquarters. We also have a co-op program with certain schools um, that we can follow up with also. Um, we have partnerships with historically black colleges um, where we bring them on board and they work for us for a year and then they have an ability to continue to stay um, if they want to make it a career. Um, and then we also, each special agent in charge has a designated recruiter um, where we then work with prospective candidates and then guide them through the testing process. There is a, a written exam. There's also an oral interview process. And then ultimately, there's the physical. And then when you get through all that, you get to go enjoy 18 and a half lovely weeks down in Brunswick, Georgia, where I was just sat three weeks ago giving a graduation speech um, that I went through myself many, many years ago. And it's changed a little bit, but honestly, it hasn't changed that much. And uh, it's hot in summer. and smelly in winter because of the, all the pulp mills and the way that the air currents drift through the academy. Um, but, you know, I look back fondly 20-something years later about how, how much I hated it at the time I was there, but um, actually it wasn't so bad after all. Now when I go back and visit, but we can, we can help. If you're interested, we, we can follow up on that. Sure. Uh, I understand detainees are easily transferred from state to state. They can be because uh, in the federal system, unlike state system, in our federal system, um, they can be transferred to and staged to where we have open uh, detention and more detention space. So in some areas, there's very little detention, period. Um, the goal, though, is when we take someone into custody is to keep them as close as possible to where they've been arrested and to minimize the number of those transfers. Okay. So, so my question was going to be, uh, does that actually create a notice requirement for families and attorneys? Yes, and there's also uh, um, a new system online through our website where people and families, something that I pushed very hard for many, many years ago, and, and it just went up live not too long ago, as well as the, uh, the bond system can all be done online. Um, I was happy to see that go to go up and running uh, a few months ago, where you can go to the ICE website, and if you're looking for a particular person in custody or that family, there are a number of things you need to do to ensure the, the privacy of the person in custody, um, but 
it's easier to, to locate them then if they get moved. And yes, there are notice requirements. We have to notify their attorneys. On the civil side, um, we don't provide attorneys. However, we give them a list of free legal services in all the areas um, if, they, if they are entitled, if they want to have one at their own expense to be represented in civil court. Thank you. Thank you.